Uh, so today we kick off a series called Let Us, not Let Us, the vegetable, uh, but two separate words, Let Us. Um, and uh, it's taken from a, a Hebrews chapter 4, where there are three Let Us phrases, and we'll deal with those three over the next couple of weeks. For instance, next week it'll be Let Us Hold Firmly to What We Believe, then the week after that it'll be Let Us Come Boldly to Him, and then today we're going to talk about Let Us Enter a Special Rest. So uh, this is critical, being able to enter a spiritual rest. And so the way that we do that is by building uh, what I call margin into our life. So if you pull out those notes, uh, at the top of the page, I gave a definition of margin. And this is what margin is. Ready? Margin is the difference between what you have and what you need. It's the difference between what you have and what you need. Needs. So here's how it works, right? That if you set aside 30 minutes to drive to church this morning and it only took 20, then you had 10 minutes of margin built in today. If you have $100 in your pocket to pay $80 worth of bills this week, you have $20 worth of margin in your life this week. And margin is the difference, right, between what you have and what you de- need. Margin becomes that buffer in our life. And this is what it'll do, right? Uh, I'm, I'm working on this, right? But if you show up five minutes early, it'll, dis- it'll decrease your stress, huh? Now, again, I'm working on that particular area because I'm usually five minutes late for meetings, you know, on a regular basis. Uh, so if we decrease our stress by having money left at the end of the month and knowing how much we have, uh, it's going to increase, uh, decrease our stress. It's if we have margin in our life, can I tell you what happens? We're better able to cope with temptation when it comes because now we have a, a buffer between that temptation and it becoming sin. Uh, if we have emotional buffer in our life, then when an unexpected problem comes, we have a little bit of margin building to handle that particular issue. We have more time to dream and more time to reflect and more time to be renewed. That sounds so good, doesn't it? But... We don't tend to live like that. I think we live in a society that pushes margin to the limit, and we're margin less. So Richard Swenson, he said in his book Margin, uh, kind of contrasted what it is to live with margin and live without it. Without it, right, we live with anxiety. With it, we can learn live with security. Without it, we're often fatigued. With it, we are energized. Without it, we often live in the red ink. With it, we live in the black ink. With it in our life, we we can have clarity when it comes to what's right and what's wrong in our life. So uh, let's just take a poll. How many of us occasionally, maybe even this morning, feel stressed sometime in your life? Would you raise your hand? Okay, just checking. How many of you, right, would say occasionally you feel financial pressure in your life? Would you just raise your hand? It's getting near the end of the month, isn't it? And so it speeds up right about now. How many of you wish you had more time? Yeah, you know, more time we we wish we had. So um, our society teaches us to buy more, do more. It's more, more, more. Rather than when we have more, creating some type of rest. And this is going to go counterculture because... We do busy really, really well, and it, it, it makes us crazy when we do busy. So how do we address this thing spiritually? I was thinking about just a family, right? If you have an eight-year-old kid, right, and on top of going to school, homework and chores, you could be running two to three nights to soccer, dance, or baseball, amen? And if you're a parent and you have more than one child, I don't even have to look at your calendar. It's crazy, isn't it? Because they get home from school, we cram down the stuff, and boom, we're on to the next Event, And if you ask someone in our culture, are you enjoying life? They would say, no, but I don't have time to talk about it. <laughs> it's just kind of this pace that we keep. So uh, margin is something that we don't have. But I think that this is really true, that some of the best things in life can take place in the margins when we create them. So uh, case in point, right? There's a story in the scripture we've looked at before about two sisters. One of the sisters had margin built into her life, and the other one did not, right? So the the, the names are Mary and Martha, so follow along as I read. So as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, 
he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. It goes on to say, she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was what? She's distracted by all the preparation that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me, huh? And he, <laughs> these two words, by the way, uh, you could plug in your own name. Have Jesus spoke to you like this? He says, Martha, Martha. Martha, Martha. I don't know about you, he said, Rick, Rick. Hmm? Yeah, the, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken from her. Two sisters, exactly the same opportunity. Now, when you look at Mary's life, did she have chores to do? Did she have laundry to do? Was she thinking there might be one more item I could get for the grocery store because Jesus is in the house? Could she think of one more thing she had to tidy up? Absolutely. But she pauses in the middle of it to embrace the moment and to enjoy Jesus, to simply enjoy Jesus. Martha, on the other hand, you know, she's distracted, right? I would say that Martha was flipping out. Like she's in the kitchen, but she's opening the door going, you know. I can't believe he's allowing that to happen here, you know? Uh, and she's, she was distracted, by the way. She's distracted by good things. They're not bad things. I mean, she's over there thinking, I got to clean the bathrooms, put out the china, light the candles, change the toilet paper so it matches, matches the shower curtain, huh? Because Jesus is in the house. In the process of doing good things, you know, she, uh, she neglected the best thing. And I think... There were probably more like Martha than we are like Mary in our culture. You know, so here's the kicker, right? Uh, Martha, Martha thinks that being busy is right. You know how I know that? Paraphrase? She goes to Jesus and says, Could you tell my sister, little Miss Lazybones, to get in the kitchen, huh? She thought she was right. And by the way, just on a spiritual sense, right? Satan loves it when we're busy. If he, can't, if he can't make us be bad, he'll, he'll cause us to be busy, and he'll applaud busyness in our life. Anything to take our eyes off Jesus. So this is a challenge, right, when we come into this message, is that we got this thing going on that's going to be counterculture. Because in our culture, we think that busyness is, is right. We think that busyness is necessary. Oh, we think busyness equals success. And so we, we pride ourselves on that, but the truth is, right, busyness doesn't necessarily lead to effectiveness. It can just make us crazy, huh? And so when margin decreases in our life, this is what happens. You can write this in. Our stress increases. Our stress increases. Let's say we didn't have any margin to get to church today. How many of you, by the way, can have some of your most unspiritual morning, mornings when you're having ready, get, getting ready for church? Yeah? I'm just saying. <laughs> you know, and so, so this whole thing, right, if it's marginless, we get coming to church and one of the kids forgets to, their shoes don't match. Now we got to go back home, get a shoe. We're going to miss the music and miss part of the message because there's no margin built into our life. And our time margin decreases as it decreases. Our stress can increase. It's that way financially. You know, the more money we earn, if we don't have margin built into it, it decreases. So let's uh, look at this pop bottle. And so I drank a little bit of this this morning. I like sweets, but not Diet, diet Pepsi before like noon, you know. Uh, but I wanted to create margin in this bottle. You know, so what happens to our life when we don't have margin? We shake it, right? And all of a sudden, that whole thing's pressurized. The margin is eaten up by pressure. So if I take the top, no, I wouldn't do that. Today. If I, if, and this is what we think. How crazy is this? We think that, the deal is we got to relieve the pressure. No, 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 no. If we relieve the pressure, it creates a mess, you know? And so the deal is we have, to, we have to maintain that margin in our life spiritually so we can manage and it keeps it from 
exploding today. So when margin decreases, our stress increases. Secondly, our relational intimacy decreases. When we're really busy and we have our to-do list, have you experienced this? That you can be with, you can be present with people, but you're not present with them? I remember when I was working Bible Kitchen, I was working as a as a builder during the day and as a pastor at night. And when it came to quiet time with my wife and time to spend with my wife, I spent it all. <laughs> I'd sit there talking to her and I'd be like this, falling asleep, you know, because I had spent it all. I had no margin built into my life. We can be out on a date night with someone we love, but we're not with them because we're thinking about what has to be done when that date is over or when the movie is over. So um, uh, the problem is, in those moments, we can't disengage from what we think is urgent and focus on what's important. So just as a poll, how many of you, right, if you're spending time with somebody important to you and we have a, a tone that lets us know when we get a message on this little phone and it's with us all the time, how many of you can hear the tone and not respond to it? Would you raise your hand? Okay. How many, you got to respond. You got to, yeah. See, I'm like that. My wife, she can lay it down, not ever look at it again until after our time is done. I'm over there going, like, I got to know who it is, you know? And so uh, I, I'm more focused on, on that than I am on being with her, right? And for some of us, it comes natural, but some of us, we have to learn, let it go. Get that puppy who's, I don't know, put it under a pillow upstairs under your bed so you can't hear it. I don't know, put it on vibrate. You know, whatever you need to do to create that margin in your life. Disengage from work. Disengage from the to-do list. Because if we don't, then our intimacy with people will suffer. Can I tell you what else? <clears throat> if we don't have margin in our life, our intimacy with God can decrease. I mean, every once in a while, this is kind of sick fun on my part. I'll bump into somebody at Pixley's, the local grocery store, that hasn't been to church in a couple months. And they'll act like they're getting cereal, but they didn't come for cereal. They just go down that aisle to avoid me. And, and, <laughs> now you're getting inside my head. I follow them. I follow them. <laughs> I'm not getting cereal either, but I want to talk to you, you know? And so <laughs> they'll say, then they go, oh, pastor. <laughs> you know, and so the, then they'll say something like this. You know, they'll say, I want to come to church, and I miss it, but life got crazy. It got busy. Yeah? Or they'll say something like this, you know, uh, have you said this before? I want to pray more. I want to read my, my Bible more, but life got crazy, and life got busy. Uh, I used to be like this with God. I used to be like this with God. But my life got crazy, and it got busy. And there's no margin in my life for that. It can happen so subtly, too busy for others and too busy for God. A marginless life, it isn't fulfilling. But I have to say, I think it's normal in the culture that we live in. So it is time, right? It's time for a come to Jesus meeting. A come to Jesus moment. So when our kids were growing up in the house, uh, every so often a conflict would build up in the house over two particular issues, and we would have a family meeting. When they were teenagers, they hated them. You want to frustrate teenagers, start having family meetings. And so, you know, we'd have this family meeting. We put the issue on the table, and we began to talk about it, and we tried to come to some type of solution. We tried to respect them and have it be a quick meeting. You know, but can I tell you why we did that? Because we knew as parents that if we didn't do it, our family would blow up. And we had to pause and, and gather the members of our family together and think through possible solutions to what was going on in our life. So, um, and this is what we knew, all right? We knew this, even though we didn't act on it all the time. You understand this in your life, that if you always do what you've always done, you always get what you've always gotten. No, no, something had to change. 
Something had to change about that particular theme. We wanted more than what we were getting out of it. Jesus wants more than that. He wants more out of our life than us being stressed out and burned out and marginless. So we have what I call a come to Jesus moment. And he called us to it, by the way. If you look at that next scripture, this is what he said. In Matthew eleven twenty-eight. 28, he said, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. He goes on to say this, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. This phrase, take my yoke, uh, you understand, right? When you yoke, it's a thing that you put on two horses so they can pull together. You know, and all he's saying is that if you put yourself on the other side of that yoke with me, your load is going to get lighter. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find, you're going to find rest for your souls, which is what we're looking for. So when we have the come to Jesus moment, all right, these are some things that happen. Jesus will refresh you emotionally. He'll refresh you emotionally. A few years ago, we took a trip uh, to our hometown of Endicott, New York. And uh, whenever we took trips back then, we took my wife's Toyota, Toyota Camry rather than my Honda Civic because hers was more comfortable. And so I was building my schedule. I had no margin in my schedule. I had to go to Kiss Car Wash and get a 15-minute oil change, yes? Because we're leaving at 1 in the afternoon. I pull into Kiss Car Wash for my 15-minute oil change, and the, the, attendant, the attendant looks down and he says, uh, your, your inspection is three months overdue. I don't drive my wife's car. You understand? And so I wasn't maintaining it. I, he said, and by the way, I'm just looking. He said, that look, that rear tire looks like it's a little low. And so I had to, I had a come to my mechanic moment. I called George, who attends this church, who works at Fire Stand, and I said, Stone, and I said, George, I need your help. And he said, Rick, come on in. I went in an hour and a half later. I walked out with an inspection, an oil change tire was fixed. The wheels were balanced. I was ready for the trip. What happened to me? I'll tell you what happened. I neglected spiritual, I neglected mechanical maintenance on my car. And all of a sudden one day it came to a head and I had to deal with it. We can do the same thing spiritually, can't we? Where we neglect regular checkups in maintenance of our life spiritually. Jesus says, come to me. He says, come to me you who are stressed out with no hope in sight. Come to me if you're a single mom whose life is about to fall apart. Come to me if you're a business guy and you think you're going to lose your business. Come to me if you're a mom with no margin in your life. Come to me if you're a dad and you're providing but it's not enough. Come to me if you feel overwhelmed and insignificant. Come to me if you feel weary and burdened. Come to me and I will give you, I'll give you rest. David gives us some good advice for emotional refreshing this is what he says in Psalms 46, 10. He says, be still and know that I'm God. Those two words, be still. We don't do that so well, do we? He says, just be still. He has to come to me sometime and say, rest. Rick, just breathe, buddy. Just breathe me in. Turn your stress and worry over to me. Let me fill you with my peace and my assurance and my hope. He says, son, would you settle? Just rest. I've got you. I know what's going on in your life. I can help you. I love this commandment that God gave to Moses for his people. He said this, right? Uh, it's one of the ten, and he makes a comment about it in, uh, in the book of Exodus. Look what he says. He says, you have six days in which to do your work, but the seventh day is to be a day of dedicated, ooh, rest dedicated to me. Oh, by the way, I just want to point out, it doesn't say on the seventh day to be one hour that you give to me. No, no, he says on the seventh day, let that be a day of rest that you dedicate to me that you dedicate to me Jesus will help us be refreshed emotionally if we do that he'll help us be restored spiritually Jesus not only pro promises emotional rest he, he promises spiritual restoration so I was thinking about Mary and Martha again and so they're in the same house 
They have the same experience, the same pressures. Both had a choice to make. One chooses to sit at the feet of Jesus, and one chooses just to keep busy with life. One sister, Mary, connects with Jesus in a deep way by sitting at his feet, and the other one never did, you know? Could it be? Could it be that there are two groups of people in church today? Both in the same room. Both with the same pressures in life. Both with a choice to make about what this experience is going to be like. One, one, choo- one group chooses to disengage from life for a minute and just be with Jesus. And the other group is so focused on the to-do list that they just check church off and they can't wait to get out so they can go on with their, with their day. Hmm? And we miss spiritual restoration. See, I believe the promise is this, right? I believe this, and I wrote it in the notes, that what we're looking for is relief. But relief only comes from belief. I, I think this, that neglecting our belief in the middle of circumstances and life happenings, when we do that, then we put our circumstances between us and Jesus. Follow? We put our circumstances between us and Jesus. But when we nurture our belief, we take Jesus and we put him in the middle, in between us and our circumstances. And life is a whole lot different when we do that. So Jesus is in the house today. Are you connected to him? Or are you postponing the decision for another time? That's a beautiful thing about spiritual restoration. We don't have to wait for it. He will give it to us when we ask him for it. You can have as much of Jesus as you want today. We set the limit. So this verse is a keeper. This next verse. Well, okay, all verses in the Bible are keepers, but I like this one. Woo! (laughs) Like this one, put on a sticky note and keep it before you because we'll need it in the culture we live in. It says, the Lord will guide you always. Read this with me, by the way, would you? He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden. Like a spring whose waters, that sounds so good, doesn't it, this morning? It's a promise. It's a promise for every one of us. He'll refresh us emotionally, restore us spiritually. The last thing is this, he'll retrain us mentally. He'll retrain us mentally. So if I was, you know, like if you flip out over those notes and you go back to where it says on the notes, time to come to Jesus and look at that verse from Matthew under there. In, in the, second, the second sentence, it says this, take my yoke up on me and learn from me. I'd underline that part of that verse. Learn from me. Jesus would say, my way won't seem normal. But your way isn't working. So learn from me. My way will seem different and weird, but it works. Learn from me. Let me have your problems. Let me recommend changes. Let me have input into your life. Learn from me. Let me retrain you mentally. Paul said it this way in the book of Romans, chapter 12. He said these words, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn how to know God's will for you, which is good, pleasing, and it's perfect. Yeah? Gang, this is where the hope is. See, Jesus does a heart work in which he forgives us of sin. And when he forgives us of sin, he becomes our savior. We get to go to heaven. But then he has to go to work on our head, which is how we've been trained to think about life. And he says, I know what you've been taught up until this point, but I have a different way for you to think. Let me change the way you think. I'm told that these big cruise ships have uh, an autopilot button 
And so when the captain gets the ship going in the right destination, he can put it on autopilot. And as long as things are calm, guess what? That autopilot will take the ship to the destination. So let's say that the captain of a ship decides he's going to change the direction of the cruise ship. And he gets on that big cruise ship wheel and he cranks that thing in the opposite direction. And if he was going south, he cranks and cranks and cranks until it's going north. But can I tell you what happens? If he doesn't change the autopilot, when he lets go of the wheel, are you with me? It starts going south again. No, no, we have an autopilot that's been set before we ever came to know Jesus about how we do life. And he comes and he said, can I have that button? <laughs> I'd like to reprogram the way you think about that particular thing. We try to do it on our own strength, and sometimes we have success, and we crank and crank, but as soon as we let go, it just spins back. What if he became the control center of our life? We start arguing with him about how we're going to do it, and we say, okay, you know, because I've told you this before that, you know, this is a process spiritually, and I'm pretty simple about this thing. So we're driving the car, and Jesus is outside the car. And then one day he becomes our Savior, and we say, you can come into the car, but please sit in the back seat. You do know this about him. He's the worst backseat driver you ever have in your life. <laughs> he just kept, you crash. He says, let me drive. Crash again, <laughs> let me drive, you know. And I say, let him drive. I say, give him control of the wheel. Now, I share with you uh, my experience. And I hope this is helpful. That at the root of my business, I have a workaholic tendency that's a false belief. I had to retrain how I thought because when I'm truthful with you, my, my value and my worth came from what I do. So when I'm busy and doing more, I feel good about myself. And when I set and rest, I think it's a waste of time. Hmm? But this is what I learned. My value doesn't come from what I do. And I don't know about you, but I can't do enough to make me feel good about myself all the time. No, what I realize is that my, my value comes from my creator. He <laughs> likes me. He likes my big chin. He likes the bald spot in my head and on the back of my head. He likes that I'm tenacious about chipping and putting when I golf. He likes my spontaneity in my life. He, he loves me. And I don't get this one, but he likes to spend time with me. He likes it when he has my attention. He likes it when I'm not trying to perform for him. But when I can just sit with him, close my eyes and quiet myself in prayer, not ask him for a thing. But Father, I just need to pray and I'm going to shut my mouth and I'm just going to hear from you today. Lord, I'm going to open up the word today. And would you teach me? Would you teach me what I need to know from this particular verse? And he's taught me, guys. I'm telling you, as someone that did not believe that was a way to do it, that he's changed my autopilot. I try to be good. I try to give him my best. But I love the time when I'm still before him and I'm quiet and I run to it now. So how about you? How about if you bow your head with me just for a minute? See, the first thing we got to do is get in relationship with God. And how many of you say, Pastor Rick, I come to church, but I've never really made Jesus my Savior by asking him to be my Savior. I, I think he's good, but I don't let him control my life. How many of you say he's not my Savior, but today I want to make him my Savior? Just slip up your hand real quick, would you? Okay. All right. Thank you, God. You can put it down. How many of you would say, Pastor Rick, he's my Savior? I need help with my autopilot. 
I need to let him control my life. Just slip up your hand real quick, okay? We're just going to pray. Father, I thank you. I thank you so much, Lord, most of all for the Bible. That it gives us everything we need to know about how to live our lives. And today, I particularly zone in on this, Lord. I pray for the one that lifted up their hand, and, and they need you to be their Savior today. Lord, help them ask for forgiveness. Help them begin to claim your, your Lordship in their life and that you're their Savior and begin to walk with you. I pray for the one, Lord, that's walking with you, but they still got their own agenda, Lord. I, I pray that they'll let you drive more and more in their life, that they'll surrender areas of their life to you. I thank you for these moments. In Jesus' name. Amen. Good. Isn't it good?